Welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann, and I would like to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. I know there are a ton of podcasts out there, and I am grateful that you are here with me today. I want to pre warn you you are in it to win it because it is just us. I will be celebrating the end as I close out the podcast with the Ask Lisa Ann mailbag, but it's Independence Day. We have a holiday on Tuesday, July 4th, and I'm on a little bit of a vacation, and Independence Day is momentous in my life. Many of you may not know the story, but I'm going to share it with you today. We're going to catch up, and I have a lot of great things to share with you. I just returned home from a secret trip. I do these secret trips because if I tell people where I'm going, then obviously people are going to go there and they're going to want something from me. That's the reality that any celebrity lives with nowadays. It is, we are now on the clock to everyone, 24-7, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, because everybody wants some clout. Everybody wants a photo. Everybody wants a fan experience. Everybody thinks that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're on. And that's not necessarily the case, but I have learned to maneuver. And I have learned to find my space in life where I can blend in when I need to, I can stand out when I need to. And so there's always that focus on, I'm going to plan a couple of things and I get to talk about them after I do them, which is even better because we have to share the story with you. But this was a weekend to go home to see my childhood best friends in Easton, Pennsylvania. And about a month ago, my girlfriend, Jenny, reached out, let me know that they're having their, their big barbecue. Her husband, Mike, is a chef, so he makes a ton of beautiful food, and they were going to have it on Saturday, July 1st. And I thought, this is perfect. I can go home for a couple of days, still be back in the city to check out the fireworks and to get some sun and enjoy 4th of July, but get really some good quality time in with people that matter to me. And as I was there, I was thinking about so many things. I'm looking around at 30 people, and I don't want to jump to that yet, so I'll get back to that. So I'm starting to plan out this trip. So a month ago, I get asked, okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm going to lock this in. I'm definitely, I'm in. I'm all in because July 1st was the very first day of me not doing a draft a day at fan tracks for the best ball, for the summer of best ball that I was doing for the entire month of June. So with that said, I was really much looking forward to just getting away from my computer, getting away from the internet. Wasn't even going to pack my computer. Wasn't going to be thinking about work, doing anything. So we're starting to plan this out. And I'm like, okay, I'll see you. I'll make sure I'm home Saturday morning. I got to do a draft Friday night at six. I got to do my podcast Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. So I do my head things. I just go to bed early, get up early and go. So I started to price out rental cars. I've driven back the past couple of times I've gone back. But getting off the island in a rental car, now I did have the inkling where I was like, okay, rental cars on Manhattan, in Manhattan are redonkulous, $500 a day before they put in all the weird stuff that gets added on. It's like another $75. And I'm like, I can't in, in good faith, like I, I can't spend a thousand dollars on a rental car even before all of the other stuff. Then I was like, well, maybe I get an Uber to Newark. Maybe they're cheaper at Newark. I looked at the, they weren't really that much cheaper. So I was like, you know what, Lisa, for many years of your life, the only way you went home was by bus. It is an inexpensive way to go. There's multiple different routes. You can take a route that only has one stop, which was what I did this time. And I looked at the bus schedule. I reached out to my girlfriend. Okay, this is when I can come in. I'm going to get dropped at Easton instead of going over to Palmer. And I'll be in at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. And I'll be leaving at 7 p.m. on Sunday night. The bus is $33 each way. Okay. A big commitment here. 70 bucks from tax or something. I mean, I'm in. Now, Port Authority can be a little bit sketchy. So you want to be you know, really mindful. I also don't want to have to use the bathroom. I don't want to have to go into any word spaces and I'm going there super early in the morning. So there's a lot of weirdness happening. There were a, a lot of cops, but there were times years ago where the military was there. And I really liked that. I felt safer. There's people that sleep in there. There's a lot of just, and I like to get there early because of course I want to be first in line because I want to sit right behind the bus driver. Who's going to bother me if I'm right behind the bus driver? Nobody. So that's, that's always the plan. So I'm going to take the bus home super excited. And I thought about it. You know, I haven't really taken the bus much. And in my, both of my books, 
the life and the life back. I talk about these bus rides because these bus rides are in reverse. My very first experiences with the bus were when we would come into the city to see either the Rockettes or a musical, or it was a school field trip. And so I can remember going to Easton bus station and taking the bus into the city, getting out of Port Authority and just walking down, you know, 42nd Street and you're, you're in it. You're like you know, the billboards, you're looking down at Times Square, you're looking at it's just that you're in it. That is when you get out of Port Authority, it is an electric, an electric place to be. And so as a kid, I loved it. I loved just, we'd walk out of that bus station and all you would hear is the roar of the city, the honking, the cars, the everything, the subway below the ground, like everything you hear. So I get up, I go to the bus station, I get in line, I've got Sports Center playing, I'm catching up on NBA free agency, I'm really excited, get on the bus, right behind the bus driver as I do, I put my backpack there, I mean somebody could sit by me if they have to, but I knew the bus wasn't going to be filled. I took the route with one stop, which is Newark, and from Newark it's a straight ride. So when you get out of the city, you get into New Jersey to cut through to get to Pennsylvania. And remember, Easton, Pennsylvania, so you know, borders with New Jersey, the city that you go through before you go over the bridge where the little river is. I don't know, little river. It's a pretty big river. People, we used to tube on it. Uh, It's Phillipsburg, New Jersey. And so you go Phillipsburg, New Jersey, or you cut through a different route. But we cut through Phillipsburg. It takes you through Southside Easton, which is where my grandmother lived, my nanny, all my aunts and uncles lived. My dad's family was the only family at that time that had moved out of South Side to the other side of town, Palmer Township. So going through there, you know, my, my godmother's house is right on the corner. So I took a little picture of it as the bus went by. I had a brick house, that big porch. I remember hours just sitting out there. And my grandmother's house is two blocks down on the left. And my uncle and my aunt lived on the right. And so, you know, I'm, I'm on the bus. First, I come through New Jersey and I thought to myself, after complaining about all of the rain, how beautiful and picturesque is all of this farmland and all of the trees and how just lush it is. And one thing about New Jersey, people can complain the taxes are high. They do keep the roads hella nice. I mean, really nice. There's no debris. I can remember being in LA and if there was a patio chair that flew off a truck, you'd drive by it for three weeks, okay? Just nice, nice roads well taken care of. So you have this smooth ride and I'm just looking out and it's, it's beautiful. You know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, there's still some areas where there's just an old farmhouse, a mill, a barn, and then just acres and acres and acres of land. And to think that's 20 minutes outside of this concrete jungle that I live in. And so I was like, you know, I'm really glad I took the bus because I get to look around. When you're driving, you're paying attention. When you're on the bus, you're just chilling. I'm listening to Sports Center. I'm looking out the window. I'm, I'm thinking about how beautiful and lush it is. We get into Easton. We go down the hill, go through Southside, see all my relatives' places, look at what places are still in business, the little liquor store that never carted us where we would buy Mad Dog 4040. And, and then all these like random memories just coming back. And so we come down into Easton and Easton is under a huge like facelift and not, and not like many cities where they just build bigger and build up and build up, just really keeping downtown Easton where everything looks so ornate, but well, well redone. And it's beautiful. And so we get down and I see this nice, large three-story building. And I'm like, well, that's brand new. I didn't go this route last time when I drove. So what is that? Well, what do you know? It's city hall and the bus station all in one. And it's gorgeous. It's brand new. There's a cute little restaurant attached to it. So I get off the bus and I'm like bewildered. I'm like, man, this is like, this is beautiful. This is like something in Europe. Like, this is super nice. It's brand new. There's not no homeless people. There's nothing weird. There's no, nobody asked me for anything. Like, it's just chill get off the bus. We got back, got in a little bit early. So got in at 9 a.m. because there was no traffic on Saturday. Left at 7.20 a.m. with one stop. Think about it. That's an easy, less than two hour trip for $33. So I get off the bus and I'm looking around. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So I walk out to the front of the street, text my girl where I know I'm going to tell you where I am. So you know where to meet me. And I'm looking around. And there's all these new restaurants with like little outdoor seating and a little furniture store and like everything looks gorgeous. It's like somewhere I would go on the road to visit and take K and take photos and be like, this is such a cute. And I'm like, 
this is where I'm from. And this is the city that is rebuilding itself. And the Crayola, Corolla factory is like one block away from where the bus station is. So my girlfriend picks me up and I'm like, what did I just get dropped off at? Like, this is the nicest bus station. Like, do you remember when it was the other bus station? The other bus station, you got out of the bus and you had to actually walk up the ramp that the traffic went through to get out. I mean, that was it. There was no indoor anything. It was like a garage. You just got out of the bus, walked out. But we were used to that. Like, no big deal, right? That's how we did it. And so... So we had to run a couple of errands. So I was thrilled to run a couple of errands because we went all these beautiful, when you're in Easton, you don't really need to take the freeway anywhere. You drive on all these little back routes where farms, I wish I would have stopped and taken video on pictures, but I was so into the conversation and just looking out the window and Jenny letting me know, you know, what has been redone. And we passed by this one beautiful farm by Bushkill Park that they redid the barn and it's this beautiful but bright, bright red with white trim. And the house is like white with black trim, but with a red door. And they're on a couple of acres up on this hill. And again, all of the rain made everything so lush and beautiful. And, you know, we just drove through more and more and more. And also we drove through spots that where I, when I grew up, there was nothing there. It was cornfields. And we go back now and it's like developed it's there's homes, there's cute little homes, there's townhouses, there's apartments, like just getting to be in a car where I wasn't driving myself and just looking at my navigation and going directly to their house, getting picked up downtown Easton and driving all through the most beautiful townships, Forks Township and Palmer Township and going in and out of stores. And a couple of funny things happened. We decided like, she's like, we got to go to Sam's club. We got to pick up something. I'm like, okay. So we go to Sam's club. I have not been to a big box store in so long that I forgot you have to have a membership. And I'm looking at it like a Walmart or something. So I just breeze right by the person checking and walk in. And Jenny's like, hold on a second, hold on a second. I had to get my membership card out. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. You have to do that. I said, I haven't been to one of these. You don't go to a big box store when you have an apartment. You get things as you need them. You let the store store them because you don't have storage. So we go in, we're looking for something we can't find. And I'm like, oh, I see a bunch of people back there I'll walk back there and ask them if they can help us. Jenny's like, yo, you can't walk back there. Like, that's the employee area. I'm like, oh, 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 oh. So the last debacle of the trip is when we go to check out. And as we check out, I'm like, all right, we, we good? Because I never take a receipt. And I'm like, we don't need the receipt, right? You know. And Jenny's like, yeah, you have to show them the receipt when you leave. And at this point, she's dying. I'm like, man, it's amazing when you stop doing things, how easily the habits can be broken. She's like, you're like a bull in a China shop right now. I take you out of the city. I bring you to this nice calm place. And you just, you're like going at your own pace. And I'm like, yeah, I really, I really noticed that as well. So Jenny and I have known each other since we were in elementary school. And of course I lost touch with so many of my friends from high school when I moved to California. I was just drawing the line in the sand. I wanted to get away from my past life. And it wasn't my friendships. It was really my family. It was really that everybody knew everybody. And I just felt very suffocated. And I had dealt with a lot of things growing up that my my friends were aware of. So nobody really pushed the issue, right? But when it, when we reconnected, it was so beautiful. And how this friendship is just picked up where we left off. And ironically, I was sitting there thinking as we were talking in the car, like, could it be that the first people I met in my life were maybe the greatest people I ever met? And because I didn't understand that yet, I didn't see that, but I see that now, how they live, how they are with their family and friends, how patient they are, how just kind they are and how different they are from the world that I I, I mainly live in, in different, in the most enlightening way. So Jenny has a son who just turned 18 and just graduated high school. And when we first met during the pandemic, when I went back, we, he and I clicked super cool. We were showing each other different things on YouTube. He's, 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 let me listen to the music that he likes, you know, all these different things. And we just back and forth, we sat, we really bonded. So I was really excited to see Trey. And I was really excited that Trey has turned 18 And that he graduated high school because I wanted to ask Jenny if I could do a couple of things this trip. Like, hey, we know that you're comfortable with him, you know, drinking around him. You've always had people over, people have smoked around him, but I brought him a couple pre-rolls. You think I can, you know, smoke some pre-rolls with him and talk to him about this? Like, 
she's like, yes, you can smoke. We only let him smoke at home. He's very responsible that way. He knows not to do it when he drives, he knows, but yes. So I'm like, all right, cool. This is great. So this will, this little part of this story is going to return when I get to what it was like after the first, after the the party. So I'm getting in on Saturday. Everybody's showing up around noon. We ran errands till about 11. So when we got back, Mike's there setting everything up. Okay. We forgot we need to get ice. We didn't get that. Okay. We realized we need a propane tank. You know, when you're throwing a picnic, I remember this clearly. There's always one more thing you want to do at the store, right? And so we, we, we doing all this trays helping, you know, we're all just kind of hanging out and people start to slowly show up. And by about four o'clock, there's probably about 30, 35 people there. They had tents set up in case it started to rain. They have an awesome fire pit in their backyard with like 12 or 15 chairs around it. It's really wide. Everybody just sits around the fire pit. The rotunda, they, they're very prepared to have this many people. And there was so much beautiful food. And last time I went home, Mike didn't know that I ate plant-based and he felt so bad that this time he set up a table of just plant-based foods for me and one other guest from friends of theirs that I met last time who I didn't realize she also eats plant-based. And so she was super excited too. So we made a beautiful tofu salad with noodles and all these amazing vegetables, quinoa, like bean salad, like a whole little table in the food area was just for me. So I was like, okay, this is just these people. Like, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy you invited me. And now you're going out of your way like this. They also redid their spare bedroom since the last time I was there. And they had just bought a new chair, like a sitting chair. And so I'm the first person staying in the spare bedroom. So when I see the spare bedroom, it's so sweet. And there's a TV in there and everything is just so beautiful. And I'm like gushing over how lucky I am that I have friends that have, that have been so solid that when we got reconnected, it was just like nothing. And we talk about so many things. So we're sitting there, we're hanging out. Everybody's eating. The food's amazing. There's a, there's a, um, Quates, there's quates going on. Uh, there's also cornhole going on. There's a cornhole tournament that lasts like three hours. They're gambling on cornhole. But meanwhile, I'm just sitting with Trey by the fire pit. Um, Lori is sitting with us, a bunch of other people sitting around. We're just talking about whatever. Everybody's telling stories. We're all having a lot of fun. And, and so I, I bust out my pre-roll. And Lori's like, oh, man, I have some, but you know, I, I, I can't roll well. Like, I, I, you know, I'm not good at this. And I'm like, all right. Like, no problem. Like, I'll do this. So I'm like, Trey, let me teach you how to roll a joint. Let me give you the specifics from cleaning to putting it in the paper to sealing to how you spin to everything. So now we have a one-on-one. So I'm so proud because again, I told you, Trey's 18. I asked Jenny if we could just smoke together and hang out and talk and and Trey knows his limits and he knows to not drink too much. He knows to smoke just a little bit, but Good, really good kid. So I was like, this is at home. So we're doing this whole thing. The irony of this is about 10 minutes ago, Jenny reaches out to me that she's at the dispensary getting some weed. And what kind of papers did I use? Cause Trey wants to roll exactly like I did. So as I'm sitting there, we smoke and Trey's good. I'll take like a hit or two. That's it. I'm good. And everyone's like, Oh, I'll take another one. I'm like, he knows his limits. Let him know his limits. I'm the same. I just like a couple, a couple hits. Straight when you're with a big group, because you pass a joint around, it's just a couple hits for everybody. It's beautiful. I didn't really want to drink that much because it was kind of humid. I knew it was going to be a long day. I knew we'd be rallying from noon to midnight at least. And, you know, I just want to stay hydrated. I'm just drinking water. Had a little wine, but I, I, I have a rule where it's like between every drink, when I'm in a group setting, I have to drink at least one full bottle of water uh, in between just because it balances everything out. And, you know, you can, you can last longer if you stay hydrated. So we're smoking and, and Trey and I are talking and learning more things and school with, with Trey's landscaping now. Loves it. Loves being outside. Loves being able to listen to music while he's working. Like loves all of it. And we were talking about he has a patch of, of eczema. And I'm like, oh, well, did you know I have psoriasis? So he's like, no, you know, like, how do you handle this? So I ask him all these great questions. I realize that the flare up on his forehead is probably because he's wearing a hat every day when he's out landscaping and he's sweating in it. So I introduce him to this silk wrap that I wear under my hat. I also wrap my hair up the, with them when I sleep. So I just so happen to have one with me. So I'm like, I'm going to give you this one. I'll order you a couple on Amazon. And next thing you know, we get into this developed conversation. Now I'm going to write Trey 
a skincare regimen. So we plan that the day after the picnic, the, the barbecue, that we are going to go to the store together and I'm going to walk him through what he needs for his skin right now. What is, and then we're going to go into the bathroom. And I said to him, what's the first thing that you do before you wash your face? He's like, well, I tie my hair back. I said, okay, what's next? He said, I wash my face. I said, no, you wash your hands. You want to start with very clean hands to wash your face because it's sensitive. So here we are, we've just spoke and we're getting into this conversation now. So skincare. And we did it the day after the barbecue, we went to the store and we picked up his daytime moisturizer with sunscreen, his cleanser, a little aquaphor. Aquaphor is great for anybody that has psoriasis or, or eczema, because when you feel a patch flaring up, the most thing you want to do is keep it hydrated. And you want to let that barrier here heal itself. And the way to do that is by putting moisture on it. And aquaphor is one of the most inexpensive, but most valuable products in any skincare regimen, even if you don't have a skin condition. In the winter when it's dry, I'll take my moisturizer at night, put it on my face, and then I will uh, put Aquaphor all over my skin for while I sleep. It doesn't make me break out. It's not that heavy. And that treatment is called slugging. Slugging is when you put your moisturizer on and then you put something heavy on top of it to sleep when you're in a drier condition. So there's that, but back, back to the, back to the barbecue. So as we're sitting there smoking, Jenny comes over and I'm like, you're going to be so proud of me. I just taught Trey how to roll. This was what I really wanted to do. And she is dying. She's dying laughing. She's like, you two are like brother and sister, the way you two hang out and the way you bring him things. He's a super cool kid and he's intelligent. He's thoughtful. He's mindful the things that this generation is aware of now that we were not aware of when we were 18, friendships and relationships being toxic, when to work on yourself, uh, all of these like just amazing things. So we had the greatest time. I got to see friends at this cookout that I haven't seen since I graduated from high school. And it, it was just so cool because, you know, you still recognize everybody. And you, it's, it's the feeling of knowing you haven't seen somebody for over 30 years that you see them, you know exactly who you are. You remember so many things about your friendship. We just sat and told stories and talked. And as we were sitting and talking, I looked around and I realized not one person there had their phone in their hand. Wasn't even near them. Wasn't even a thing. You didn't even see phones out on the table. Everybody was in the moment, hanging out, talking, eating, drinking, having the best time. I noticed that and I thought, wow, when you're in a community where everything you have is in front of you, you don't look out to the internet to find more excitement or feel FOMO or see what other people are doing because you don't care. I realized at that moment, none of them care about anything else than where they are at that very moment. I, by the, so you know, had my phones in my backpack, in my bedroom for the weekend. I didn't even know there was a Twitter outage until I checked the news on the bus home. I knew nothing about that. I set up my Instagram posts before I left, put a couple things that were going to land at certain times and was like, I'm not going to look. So as I looked around at everybody and everybody is laughing and carrying on and having the best time. And as I sat with each one of my girlfriends that I grew up with, that I hadn't connected with till yesterday, the conversations we had were so beautiful. Most of my girlfriends have incredible gardens, like insane gardens, huge backyard gardens. We talked all about everything that they're growing, how they pickle it, different things they've learned to make with it. They all share different seeds. So and I was like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's such a nice life. It's such a great way to live. This is how I was raised. And I love to know that my friends are carrying on this legacy with their children because they all have kids. Three of them have kids that all turned 18 this year. And I'm like, how wild is that? Like you all have one child and they're all turning 18, three boys, all 18. But 
to know that their kids grew up with their parents gardening and bringing in fresh foods and canning those fresh foods. So over the winter, that's how I grew up. I never had frozen vegetables or canned anything unless it was the school lunch or at a friend's house. All of us had gardens. And so when we'd go visit our, our aunts or uncles that most of my aunts and uncles that lived on the South side didn't have as big of a yard. And I think that's one of the reasons my dad wanted to move to Palmer Township. He wanted an acre, you know, he wanted huge farmland. So for them, they had small little gardens and maybe they got some tomatoes, but every time we showed up at someone's house over the summer, we had bushels, those old wooden woven baskets of produce from our garden. That's just what we did. You, you brought over four or five cucumbers, some eggplant, some zucchini, some squash, some tomatoes, some peppers, um, maybe some herbs corn, if we had a good corn crop that year, if the storms didn't knock it down, but like, that's how I grew up. And it was just awesome to know that they're finding that joy that we grew up with as a fiber in their lives. And it's just so special. And I loved it. And so we sat and we talked and as the party thinned, you know, Jenny's making sure everybody takes food home with them because everybody, we have so much food. I mean, Mike cooked it up for a hundred people. Uh, we, we, you know, there were some things that I told them they couldn't give away because I wanted more of them, but I ate a lot. I ate through the whole day and just grazed. I would go in and try something else. I mean, Mike's macaroni and cheese is like some of the best, mac it's the best macaroni and cheese I've ever had anywhere. And so of course I had to have that, you know, and they're very mindful too about when people are starting to act like they're leaving, making sure that they have some soda, some water, they haven't been drinking too much, too close. Like my friends have done this for years and know how to do these things responsibly and mindfully. And I just, and everybody lives literally five minutes away, which is also so beautiful, but I just loved it. And as we were the last ones left, sitting around the fire at midnight, talking, uh, me, Jenny, and Trey, her son, decided that we were going to go in. I hadn't done shots all day. They're like, let's do a shot. And I'm like, okay, everybody's gone. It's just us. Let's do a shot. So we all did a shot of Jameson, went back out by the fire, just sat until we all started to realize like, we're done. We're so tired. So as I got ready for bed and laid down and just really thought about the fact that like, I didn't touch my phone. I didn't care what was going on on the internet. I was around people who are genuinely just satisfied with life, have made and created families and lives and homes and are proud of where they live. Like when I brought up the bus station being so nice, they all rattled off all of these incredible restaurants. And at that time, Jenny's like, oh, we're going to go to Mesa for brunch tomorrow. You're going to love it there. It's right down by the best. It's one of those spots you were looking at, like that place is beautiful. But I laid in bed thinking about how fortunate I am that when I was moving back to the East Coast, I decided I'm going to start reaching out. Facebook is so easy to find people. And there just so happened to be a Facebook group that was started for my 30-year high school reunion that was supposed to be summer of 2020. Now, obviously, that got canceled because of COVID, but we all reconnected because of that group. So that's how this kind of started. And that's how this grew. And, you know, my friends remember a lot about my childhood, even to things that I don't. My friends remember how tumultuous my parents' divorce was. My friends remembered uh, how abusive my father was. My friends have stories that I really pushed down in my life. And when we reconnected and started to share these stories, they also shared how proud they are of me, that what I was up against as a young person could have put me and pushed me in any direction and how flabbergasted they are of how great my life is. Like they talk about, they ask me about my trips because they're following me on social media. And they're like, man, that looks so great. So that I get to go in and be like, oh, this is what paragliding was like and show Switzerland. Me and Trey looked through photos for hours on Saturday and hours on Sunday. I had to show Trey everything I've done that's cool since the last time I saw him. It was like, loved it. We talked about places Trey wants to travel. But my friends are the people from my childhood that have every memory of my life that even some I ch chose not to remember and have this respect and pride in who I've become that is like 
it's, 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 I, I didn't even ever see this coming in life. Like I didn't even imagine this was possible. And it even connecting on the next level with friends that I hadn't seen yet till Saturday, like hearing their joy for my existence and the life that I created, how I've lived and makes me even happier that I moved back to New York because now I'm starting to convince them like, Hey, you guys got to come to my place. We got to go back and forth more often. Now I really want to, you know, really cherish these relationships more and remember that I grew up in a beautiful place with beautiful people. And just because I had this upbringing and I have parents that aren't in my life and I don't have a relationship with my family doesn't mean that I shouldn't go back to Easton, Pennsylvania and celebrate the, the, the cutest little city where I grew up and the greatest friendships that were handed to me just by where I grew up. So the whole evolution, to wrap this up, the whole evolution of now I feel different about riding the bus to Easton, Pennsylvania, which at one time made me very sad. On the way in, I'd be going through moments of feeling how toxic the time was going to be that I spent there. And that was only because my family could be hard on me in many ways regularly. And then the feeling that I would feel when I'd be leaving and coming back to New York years ago of just exhaustion from all of how toxic it was and, and how bad everybody made me feel about myself and my choices and how I live my life and the things that I do. And this bus trip was very different. It was just pure joy going in and it was pure joy going out. When I was leaving on the bus last night, I didn't even listen to sports news. I wasn't even ready for that. Just put on some soft music, looked out the window and thought about how lucky I am to be right here right now and to have people that I grew up with that are just so genuinely fucking awesome and kind and beautiful inside and out that they've welcomed me back home to where my heart is. Your heart is kind of at home. You're driving through, you're seeing things that you just remember the trestle where you used to go and smoke weed at Bushko Park, all these things. And so I'm grateful. And it brings me to the solo moment for 4th of July. So you may or may not know that my very first flight was a one-way ticket to California to get in the business. That flight was very purposely booked for 4th of July. So I wanted to claim my independence by flying on a one-way ticket to somewhere I've obviously never been, didn't know what my situation was truly going to be like, but knew that I was getting picked up at the airport by a man that I met through other entertainers that came into Al's Diamond Cabaret, and I was going to be staying at his house until I landed myself a contract in the industry. And I was so excited for this dynamic change in my life that I did not want a round trip ticket. And when I landed in California, being that it was 4th of July, I was going to an industry party my very first day in, in California on 4th of July. And I wrote details about this in my first book, The Life. You should order it and read it because the details are to a T. You can listen to the audiobook. You can order it on Amazon or you can get it personally autographed through me at shoplisaann.com. But so 4th of July means a lot to me because it's when I claimed my independence. I was planning on starting a new life. I was planning on getting away from all of the emotions that I had in my small area back home with family turmoil, with just feeling like an outcast, with just escaping Easton and going to Philadelphia and then to Quaker town with all of the moves that I made from graduating high school till I moved to California. And I wasn't moving there yet. I was going there on a one-way flight to get a contract to then decide, am I living here? And if so, where am I living? And am I moving all of like, what am I doing? And to think that full circle, 30 years later, I get to go home to Easton, Pennsylvania before 4th of July and have this bus ride where I get to think about how my life has grown and changed and how some of the most beautiful things will always be the same. Easton, Pennsylvania is a beautiful little city. 
and driving through the townships and up the hills and through the farmland and the new neighborhoods and the old neighborhoods and the one perfectly redone 1818 farmhouse. All of the beauty will always be the same. And I bolted from it so fast because at that time and at that age, all I felt was the toxic energy that surrounded me. And to think that I've embraced my life to such a point that going back there brings me so much joy while I still know and confirmed by my friends that I get to spend time with and feel love from, the move that I made was the absolute best choice I could have made. Because what I did was developed myself to be a stronger individual, to have financial freedom, to know that I only needed myself, and then to make choices along the way of what I was going to do and where I was going to live. When I decided to move back to the East Coast, there were so many things I missed about being here. But one of the things that I didn't really consider was how much I missed my friends from growing up, my hometown. I missed the seasons. I missed the people. I missed the energy. I missed being the, the, the just simplicity of when you get out of this busy city in New York and you're driving through the little town that I live in and the back roads that we take to go everywhere, you're not sitting in traffic. You're sitting at a four-way stop. <laughs> you're just, it's just awesome. So 4th of July was my first flight. At that time, you could still walk your friends into the airport. My friend Sledge, who traveled with me on the road for the first two years I was on the road, he walked me into the airport and sat there with me. And I remember just being incredibly excited about the unknown. Nothing was guaranteed. I didn't even know if I truly trusted this person that was picking me up at the airport that I was staying at his house. But I knew one thing. I knew that I need to really make a huge change in my life. I knew that I really need to grow. I knew that I really needed to find myself and I really needed a new identity that was stronger than anything I knew in my past. And when I sit and think, because I can still picture that gate on the corner at Philadelphia airport and that flight, which was US Air, and flying on 4th of July was awesome because it wasn't a busy travel day. And it was my very first flight because we had a motor home and we drove everywhere. And so that excitement of just like, I walked down that, that lane, you know, the, uh, what do they call it? The thing that you walk in to get onto the gate, through the gate, through the thing, to the plane. You know what I'm talking about. I walked through that and I thought to myself, who knows what's going to happen next, but I already know that everything that's already happened. And that just changed my life. From there, I was able to take every chance to go to feature bookings. Again, I'm getting picked up by a stranger that I don't know if I trust, staying in a place that I don't know if I feel safe, going to a club that I don't know anything about. You know, of course it gets easier after you return to places, but your first couple of years, that is your life. And taking that chance on 4th of July and claiming the independence that I didn't even know what it was yet was the game changer that I needed. So I want to leave you with this after this moment of storytelling. What have you done to test yourself and to believe in yourself enough to know that you're willing to take a chance? I know a lot of freelancers, they're taking a chance every day because you never know if more work is going to go in. You never know if you're going to work for that person again. Sometimes you don't know if they're going to pay you. There's a lot of variables. But what are you doing that makes you feel the most independent? This is something I'd love for you to email me at asklisaann at gmail. Whether it's something you added into your life, like you love to swim, you love to bike ride, you like to horseback ride, you're a skier. Um, maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's a, you started volunteering. Maybe you left your job and started a new one. But what have you done for yourself that has piqued that independent streak in you, reminding you how much you believe in you, how much you trust in yourself to make the right decisions, how much you trust in your internal compass to protect you and to guide you. I cannot wait to hear your stories. Please send them to asklisaann at gmail.com. Before I get to the mailbag, there is always reminders. Yes, I did make it through the summer of best ball at fan tracks, but it's not over. It's just not every day. And I'm taking this week off and then I'm going to get beat back to scheduling. I have three drafts to make up that we didn't get to do during June. I'm going to add other drafts in, in July and August. I'll have different formats for some of these best balls to mix it up a little bit. 
but I am so glad that I did them because I made connections with new friends that were not only in the draft room at Bantrax, but also in my chat for all of the YouTube lives that I did. If you want to learn more about best ball, you can go back and watch some of my YouTube lives that I did to cover the draft. So I go play by play. You'll see what drafters were taking with players, what rounds players were going in, the familiarity of players that have moved to different teams, the players that were picked up in the draft in April, like all of the things. Best ball is a really fun format. It's just a draft, but it is a season long league. Your best scores are tallied each week. And at the end of the season, you can win. So you just have to draft a really deep team, 20 rounds, but it's a fun way to get into it without all of the management. If you're busy, if you work weekends, if you have kids, if you still want to be in the fantasy football community, but you know, you don't have the time to commit, sign up for a best ball draft at fantrax.com. They are a ton of fun. The app is amazing. The, the, the platform for your computer, amazing. So if you're using it from that interface, there's a chat in each feature. So you're able to keep in touch with your league mates through the season. I'll be recapping those leagues once a week through the entire NFL season, talking with all of you about like whose teams are doing the best, what players we had across the board that were just underperforming or overperforming and giving shout outs to the league lead, the league leaders in these 30 best ball drafts that I did. So check out Fantrax.com. I'm moving my season long leagues over to Fantrax and starting a new season long league with 11 people who were in those draft rooms with me in June. So a ton of fun there. Maybe you want to have a little ton of fun. Don't have as much fun as the guy at the Mets game that was leaning too hard and fell over onto the field. Now, luckily he didn't get hurt. He stood right back up, but of course he was afraid he was going to get tackled by the security from people that do run onto the field from time to time. So it was funny. He's like, hands up. He's like, I just fell over. Are you all right? Dude, the game's going on. Don't be that guy, but go to a baseball game this season. It is my favorite way to see a game. Go to TicketRev.com. Check out the app. Check out what's performing near you. Maybe it's a concert. Maybe it's a show. Maybe it's a sporting event, but you can get them all. Download the app, TicketRev. You can follow on all social media platforms at ticket rev. So you also want to be doing your best, feeling your best and your best at all times. And guys, look, don't, don't beat around the bush about it. You know, she's not going to tell you, but a sex life is a very, very, very important part of your life, of our life. So do the right thing. Go to ultrafarmrx.com. Ever feel like your performance just doesn't measure up? Does worrying about it make it worse? Let me let you in on a little secret. Many men use Viagra and Cialis not just to treat ED, but to boost their performance and last longer. Whether you're in front of the camera or behind closed doors, every man can use a little help to last longer. It's never been simpler to get what you need. At ultrafarmrx.com, you can get doctor-trusted treatments 100% confidential online from your phone. No awkward doctor visits. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Discreet and confidential, guaranteed. Better performance is just a few clicks away at ultrafarmrx.com. Now it is time for the moment you've all been waiting for. The Ask Lisa Ann mailbag is right here. If you want to get involved, send your emails to asklisaann at gmail.com. And mind you, I hope that I get to read a lot of independent streak stories. You can put in the subject matter, independent streak. And tell me something you've done recently that is that has just piqued that feeling of true independence in you. I cannot wait to hear those, but these are going to be a bit different. Let's get to it. It is time for the mailbag. I do believe that people must be out enjoying summer. I'm not getting as many emails, uh, even as many creepy ones, which is all welcomed. But we do have one here that could go either way, so I'm going to make it go the right way. Jamie says, hello, Jamie. This is, hello, Lisa. This is Jamie. I am 45 and I'm from Oklahoma, live in Oklahoma City. I am a big fan. I love all of your movies. 
wish I could meet you in person. It would be really big and a pleasure meeting. My question is, are you still doing porn? I love what you're doing now. What made you get into this? You look like you're really doing great and loving moi. Kind of hard email to read. Um, chat GPT could be your friend, buddy. It could write you much better composed emails, but let's talk about this. I mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, why I do secret trips, because of course, if people find me somewhere, or if people know I'm going somewhere, they invite themselves. Can I do this with you? Can I do that with you? Imagine millions of people a week asking for time with you. It's suffocating. It's exhausting. It's annoying. It's ridiculous. And it's crazy, but it is all part of the game. So I remind everybody that I'm willing to meet people at events. Not when I go to an event after the event, not before the event, at the event, because that's considered work. I don't work for anyone. I work for myself. So when somebody feels that they're entitled to my time and to meet me, spend time with me, have a coffee with me, to me, that's considered work because somebody's kind of telling me what to do. Somebody's kind of telling me that they are entitled to my time just because they like me. There's a lot of people I like. I would never be entitled to their time. I would never reach out to Tina Fey and be like, hey, let's have a coffee. Just wouldn't do it. I appreciate what celebrities do, what they add to entertainment, same with athletes, but I don't feel that I'm entitled to one-on-one -on -one time. So when people say meet me, I have to remind people, I do meet people at events. I don't know where this became, I'd really love to meet you. I don't know where this became normalized, but I read what it's called and I have to, oh, my phone's in the other room. It's something like para relationships or para. I just read about this the other night. I can't believe I didn't write it down, but it's about relationships that are one-sided that are formed on the internet. And that person then, then kind of forces that relationship on the other person. Yes. I did just pause to look this up because I have to bring this to us. Okay. They're called parasocial interactions. Parasocial interactions refers to a kind of psychological relationship experienced by an audience in their meditated encounters with performers in the mass media, particularly on television and online platforms. Viewers or listeners come to consider media personalities as friends, despite having no or limited interactions with them. PSI, parasocial interactions has initials. It's PSI. PSI is described as an illusionary experience such as media audiences that interact with a persona, talk show hosts, celebrities, social media influencers, as if they are engaged in a reciprocal relationship with them. How crazy is that there's actually words to this. So media users are loyal and feel directly connected to their persona as much as they are connected to their close friends by observing and interpreting their appearance, gestures, voice, conversation, and conduct. Media personas have a significant amount of influence over their media users, positive or negative, informing the way that they can perceive certain topics or even their purchasing habits. Studies involving long to Longitudinal effects of parasocial interactions on children are still relatively new. Um, so I learned this because I was reading a thread and somebody's like, you need to check your parasocial interaction level. And I was like, oh, must look this up and learn, must know what this is about. Cause I think they know what they mean. So there was a long winded answer to James, but James, so, you know, I do meet people at events and that's the only time I meet people. Um, I don't share my time anyone because time is the only resource that is not renewable and we only have so much of it. And I get to spend my time with the people I choose just like anybody else that has a job on their free time gets to spend time with the people they choose. It's pretty simple. So, uh, I am not still making movies. I know that's new to a lot of people because people are just hopping on the internet, but James is 45. He's been on the internet a while. I love what I'm doing now. I love hosting this podcast, being a part of all the different things I'm a part of, working with fan tracks, working with Ticket Rep, working with Ultra Farm RX, getting out to travel to do events, going to Exotica, which I will be in Miami at Exotica June 14th. 15th and 16th. And I will be uh, in Canton, Ohio at the Fantasy Football Expo, August 11th, 12th, and 13th. So I got a lot of cool things coming up. So don't you worry if you're in an area where potentially there's an event, I will meet you there. But if not, sorry about it. Just sorry about it. Next says, 
So I'm sure you will get this because thousands of guys have written to you and I'm sure you've been asked this before, but if you were, if you were single, what kind of guy would you go for? Would you go for a perfectly sculpted body or one that has a little padding? I hope your video cast goes well. I will try to get home to see it. So I am not out chasing a bodybuilder. Okay. But I will say this. Fitness is a sign of someone who prioritizes their wellness, their life, the longevity of their life, uh, and their self. People who take care of their bodies, that is self-care. That's like taking care of your car to make sure that it's going to last longer. So when I see somebody that doesn't take care of themselves, my first thought is, why don't they take better care of themselves? What could they be thinking? This body's going to break down eventually. Like, why are they, why are they unhealthy? It seems, but I understand not everybody's into it, but there's a level of wellness and mindfulness and being very preventative that comes with that. And that's a person that I align with. So it's not necessarily that I'm looking for a guy that's a bodybuilder or that's uber fit or, or that's, but I do need to have a guy that is in shape. And that's not shaming anybody, but it's a mindset. That means you prioritize your health. That means we could potentially live longer together and do more things with less limits. And for busy people who find the time to work out, I often find that the people that are in the worst shape are spending more time doing things that are also making their health worse, like watching too much TV, playing video games for hours, sitting on their computer for hours, not making time for oneself to get out and take a walk. Even if you're not a gym person, there's many ways where you can take care of yourself. So when it comes to the question of a perfectly sculpted body or one that has a little padding, I would say no to the one that has a little padding. And I know most women who are also of the same mindset as me of just fitness and taking care of ourselves and, and being able to live a long and vibrant life, we would see it the same way. It's not that we're shaming somebody for not for being overweight, but that's why it is a lot harder. Being healthier shows that you take care of you. So I'm not looking for somebody that's perfectly sculpted but I'm definitely not going to be with somebody that has some padding. Uh, thank you for that question. Okay. We got a howdy from down under. Hey, Lisa Ann wanted to say big fan and always will be. I'm sad that you left the business, but forward to a better life. Want to know if you're planning on visiting Australia one day. I live in sunny Brisbane, Queensland. I do have another question, but I want to ask in this message, maybe another day, Shane. Well, it could have taken a creepy turn. Glad he didn't ask the second question. I have been to Brisbane and I'm so fortunate that I've been to Australia multiple times going to Sexpo with Fleshlight. So if I do go back to a Sexpo, you'll be the first to know because I post all of these things on all of my social media at The Real Lisa Ann. That makes that super easy. And I will be sure to let everyone know if that's where I'm going. But as for Jane, as for the second question, probably don't ask it. Because if I go to Australia, it's not just to meet you. I'm going to Australia to go to an event. You come to meet me. We'll see each other there. Again, the word is parasocial interaction. Initial PSI. Isn't PSI also for checking the gauge on your air on your tires? I don't know, but I am into the fact that now I know the psychological term is parasocial interactions. If you feel closer with me than I do you, we probably have a parasocial interaction going on here. And uh, I don't think it's the greatest, greatest thing ever. Uh, let's see. Let's see if there's one more thing that's interesting. Okay. The parasocial relationship does not follow the pro process of a typical long-term relationship. The media user remains a stranger to the media figure, whereas the strangeness would gradually evaporate uh, in a typical social interaction. Many who possess dismissive attachment style to others may find one-sided interactions to be preferable in lieu of dealing with others, while those who, those who experience anxiety from typical interactions find comfort in the lives of celebrities consistently being present. It's wild. So we now know there's, there's a word and it's real. And I got a lot of parasocial going on. Sounds like, sounds like something. We have one more email right here. If you want to get involved, ask Lisa Ann at gmail.com. This is from James. James is being invited into my new league that I am commissioning 
at Fantrax. James was one of my favorite of many. So many great people I met this month doing these best balls. But James and I were in the room. Uh, Ruez Mode is his team name. He signed off this email, Ruez Mode out. And I absolutely love it. And this is a great email, so I saved it for last. Dear Lisa, as of late, you've been talking about fasting and how it's been incredibly beneficial for you. Between hearing your experiences with fasting, along with seeing Chris Hemsworth experiment with fasting on his show, Limitless, I'm planning to experiment with 24-hour fasting soon myself. How difficult was it at first to start fasting? And do you have any tips on how to keep consistent with it? I hope this email finds you on a great day. P.S. I'm looking forward to playing against you in best ball. I just might see you in the championship. Ooh, let's duke it out, James. I love this email. So yes, I've been an intermittent faster for years, which means the goal is to eat all of your food within an eight hour time frame. So it's 8, 16. And then for 16 hours, you're able, your body is able to process everything that you ate, um, get rid of anything bad. You're not just continuously feeding. When you continuously feed your body, your cells actually get lazy at producing all of the things that your body can naturally produce itself. They don't need to, but they will go into action when there is not food automatically be putting in, calories automatically putting in. Really helpful to burn any little tough areas. Like I get a little area by my arms and by my knees where I just have little fatty pockets, right? And they're, they're really hard to get rid of. But since I've been fasting, adding fasting into my intermittent fasting, I'm noticing a tremendous difference. Tremendous. So what helped me a lot, James, was reading that book, Eat, Stop, Eat. Because to me, if I read the medical breakdown on why I should be doing this, then I can get out of my own way. Because the hardest thing about fasting for 24 hours is the mental game. You automatically feel at a certain time you should eat. So one of the things I decided to do to make it easier on me to not think about it, to go the 24 hours, is I plan it in advance. So I plan it on a day where I know I'm going to be either, you know, keeping busy one way or another. So you know that you're going to fill that like two hours a day where you would be preparing food, eating, preparing food, eating. That's just going to be when you decide I'm going to slug a water to feel full or I'm going to take a walk. I find little busy activities. So when I think, oh my gosh, this is when I should be eating. I'm like, oh, you know what? Why don't you do a load of laundry? Uh, why don't you do something? Why don't you reach out to a friend? Find little tasks that can keep you distracted. And reading that book is going to help you get into the right mindset to accomplish the mission. It's an easy way to do it. If you say, I'm going to eat my last meal at 6 p.m. at night on a Thursday, and you're going to eat your next meal at 6 p.m. on Friday, then it's not really like you feel like you've starved yourself for a whole day. You didn't. You went to bed full because you ate at 6, and then you get you go, you go let everything burn. And my experiment of doing it once a week right now for um, – six months. Today is my day. So what I did was yesterday I finished my last meal at 1 PM. I didn't eat anything else for the rest of the day. I didn't eat last night. I got up today, did my workout, had water. I am going to wait till one and then I'm going to make myself a smoothie. So I've already made it through my 24 hours. It gets easier and easier and easier. But I think after I did it the first time, I realized how good I felt James. And that makes it easier too. So plan it in a time where it's easy, where you're not going to be in like a social setting where you know you're going to be going out to eat. Like plan it, thought, think it out of when it's going to work and try it. And make sure that you're ready for that meal 24 hours because there's no reason to go any further than that. So if you do 6 p.m. on Thursday night, you can eat at 6 p.m. on Friday night. It's not that difficult. I cannot wait to hear your results. Keep me posted with them. I cannot wait to see you in the championship that is awesome because we're going to meet there in our best ball leagues at Fantrax James. To the rest of you, a solo episode all about freedom independence. My freedom, my independence, and my absolute joy for the connections that I have for the most beautiful area where I grew up and the most beautiful people who have been incredibly kind to me and lived these beautiful lives and have raised amazing children. And I said to Jenny, I was like, Ian, thanks for having him so we could hang out. Like, this is so cool. Just just great people. And it's fun to watch your friends' lives develop and being a proud parent, you know, that's huge. Having good kids, it's huge. So all of these beautiful things I celebrated with you and shared my little story of my secret trip. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check out Fantrax.com, download the app, 
ticketrev.com, download the app and go to Ultra Farm RX and do your quick two minute survey. A US licensed physician will get back to you and your packages will be delivered discreetly to your door. I appreciate all you for listening and I hope to see you on Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann. Thank you for listening to an all new episode of The Lisa Ann Experience. Thank you.